So my generation was a rather um, disadvantaged one in the sense that we came into a time when the Nigerian educational system, for some reason or the other, removed history from our learning. So that before any of us encountered history at all, we had to reach our senior secondary school classes. My first encounter with any kind of history came by chance. By chance. I was at the Kashim Ibrahim Library of Amadou Bello University in the year 2000 to look for materials so as to write uh, the introduction of my project work. I had finished the project, but I needed to write some very proper introduction to what I had done. And I thought I needed to read up on some literature. After about an hour or two, I was done gathering all the information that I had. And I felt, OK, maybe I could just do some reading. I saw these big encyclopedias all over the library. And I approached one of them. And I began to see that the encyclopedia was designed in such a way as to um, give information on varied topics. For some reason, and that year was 2000, so it was two years after I had come to Christ, I wanted to know about Christianity. So I went to the Christian section, and I was reading Christianity, and I became more interested on the section that had to do with, um, the pro with Protestantism. And so I was studying Protestantism, and that was how I encountered the whole history of the Protestant religion. That was my first encounter with history. And that was in my final year of the university. It's understandable because I read the sciences. I read electrical engineering. I would define history as a compendium of the science of human behavior. That is, a person who is steeped in history is an individual who can predict the outcome of life. How does he do that? He's not a prophet, but simply because he had read about and he has observed what has come from a lot of, I mean, from the behavior of people, he can tell what will happen most, almost to uh, any other person who is behaving in that manner. And in this guise, there are all kinds of history. We have histories of nations. So we have history, the, the, the nations that colonized us, Britain. We are very, very familiar with such histories. Leading nations in the world today we're familiar with the history of the Americas. We're familiar with the history of uh, the uh, eastern parts of the world, Russia, and so on. There are histories of religion. Okay, so there's history of Christianity, history of Islam, history of Buddhism, and so on and so forth. There are histories of individuals. There are histories and so on and so forth. And just like I said in the beginning that I read up on Protestant history. Today, in this discussion, I want to talk to you about redemptive history. What is redemptive history? Redemptive history is the biblical account that begins with creation and ends with the apocalypse. God created the world, and God has stated in his word that he's also going to come to this very world and destroy the world. So God who created will destroy. We who are theologians understand why God is going to destroy the world because of the presence of sin. Sin has corrupted all that God has created. And the world as it is right now is degenerating until, until a time when God himself will destroy it and then God will create a new heaven and a new earth. So redemptive history is the whole story, a whole account between the time God created the world and when God will bring an end to this world. Redemptive history also tells us the story of how God went about redeeming fallen humanity through Jesus Christ for his own glory. And now that is very important because like we have said, history is a compendium of our stories about human behavior. Okay, redemptive history is a compendium of stories about what God was doing in the lives of people. And God was doing all of this so as to redeem fallen humanity. Who is fallen humanity? Like we have said in these videos, in our previous videos, man fell through Adam and Eve. And God set out the initiative, he set out to save man from his fallen state. In the process of doing that, God sent his holy son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sin. 
all of that story from creation to the fall of man, God's relationship with Israel, and then Jesus Christ coming and Jesus Christ dying and rising from the dead and his apostles giving us the salvation message. All of that is redemptive history. Now, the Christian gospel is an enunciation of redemptive history. So anywhere you find a minister of the gospel, all they are doing is to tell the world about what this history is all about. And that's why Christians don't take, we don't play with history at all. History is very important for us. And redemptive history is even a lot more important. Now, this implies three things. Number one, that a gospel minister, a Christian minister, must contend for the veracity of redemptive history. Number two, a gospel minister must contend for the preservation of redemptive history. And number three, a gospel minister must contend for the propagation of redemptive history. Now, so let's take the first one. The gospel minister must contend for the veracity of redemptive history. The redemptive history is a reality that stands on its own, but it cannot become a reality in our lives except we're able to show the world that this message is true. If in some one way or the other this message is impugned or is adulterated, it is going to affect the, our message. The message of redemption. So that is why when at some point in our history, in a very near uh, past history, a man came and began to contend against the message of creation. Began to say that uh, the earth is, uh, is an old earth. The earth is almost billions and billions of years ago, uh, years old. God did not create the earth. The earth came about by a great big bang. And we originated from monkeys and all of that. Christians needed to contend against that reality because the very minute the redemptive history is impugned upon, our message begins to lack merit and it lacks its power to be able to save. So the gospel minister must contend for the veracity of re the redemptive history. The second one is that the gospel minister must contend for the preservation of redemptive history. Now, veracity is one thing. That's the truth of it. Preservation is another thing. And that's to say that, first of all, the message of the gospel or the message of, uh, of, 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 of Scripture must not, must not die with a generation. Okay? In the past, before printing, what people did was to copy. They hand copied the, 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 the Scriptures. That in doing that, they were able to preserve redemptive history after the days of hand copying we've come to the time of printing and printing has made uh publishing of the bible a lot easier in fact the the, the, the inventor of the printing press in 1450 gutenberg the first book he printed was the bible and it is very very instructive okay that the word of god is preserved either by printing i mean by hand copying or by printing, and in all of this, ensuring that there are no errors in what is written. Okay? Redemptive history, or the redemptive, uh, the gospel, the redemptive history is preserved through, uh, through scriptures. And the scriptures must be preserved by all means. Okay? And so the third one, of course, is that we must contend for its propagation. The propagation of redemptive history. And that is to say that... Every generation must ensure that there's liberty of the preached word, the liberty of the preaching of the gospel. Okay? And there was a time, there are places in this world today where Christians cannot preach the gospel. We must pray, we must plead with God, we must contend with the laws of such society that will permit for the free dissemination of the gospel. There are other places in Canada today, there are laws that say that you cannot change the minds of young people about uh, their commitment to homosexuality. If you do that, you can go to, to jail for it. For such places, we need to contend and ensure that there's, I mean, there's liberty is given to the preaching of the gospel. So there's a veracity of re re redemptive history. 
there is a, a preservation of re re redemptive history, and there's also the propagation of redemptive history. Why is all of this important? Why do we do what we do? We do all this because it is only within redemptive history that humanity can find salvation. Okay? So besides the glory of God for which we are saved, beside the fact that Jesus Christ has, has come to die to save sinners to himself, the other end and the other responsibility of the Christian church is to ensure that people hear the gospel and in the process of hearing the gospel that they may repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this will not, be, this will not happen except they hear redemptive history, except they hear the message of the gospel, except they hear the message of the Holy Scripture. The end of genuine Christian ministry is in leading a sinner out of his depraved worldview and bringing him to appreciate and embrace the Christian worldview. No matter what happens, no matter the reality on ground, every human being has a worldview. Every human being has a mindset against Holy Scriptures. Our duty as ministers of the gospel is to be able to bring the biblical worldview and to show it to every human being and ensure that their own worldview bows to ours. And like I have said before, we don't do this, do this through the force of arms. Rather, we do it through prayer. We do it through persistence. We do it through, I mean, uh, continue preaching. We do it through means like this one, creation of videos where the gospel is continually preached. The Christian gospel, I mean, the Christian worldview is redemptive history. And the redemptive history cannot be impugned upon. We cannot compromise upon it. Redemptive history is the whole story from Genesis to Revelation. When God began with the creation of the earth. And when God went on to have a relationship with an elect people, the children of Israel. And where God was able to give these people his laws. And where through the giving of the law, God was able to show that the law was not given so that people may live perfectly, but so that they may know their failings, so that they may know their sins. And now when man knows his sins and his failings, he's able to turn to God to save him from his sins. And that is when Jesus Christ came in the New Testament. He lived a perfect life. He died as the Lamb of God, and in his dying and resurrecting, he took away the sins of the world. So that as many who turn from, the, uh, from their sins and turn to God to save them from their sin, they are given Jesus Christ. So Jesus is able to save men from sin. And in living a Christian life, we continue to pass this message to every man, calling every man to bow to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is this important? Because a day is going to come when the God of the judge of all the earth is going to judge every man by this message, by this redemptive history. And as many as reject the Holy Son of God will find themselves separated from God in a place of gloom, gloom, gloom and doom and will be swallowed up in the wrath of God. But as many who believe on the Lord Jesus will spend their time with God in eternity, worshipping the Lamb of God, worshipping the God of all creation. It is only redemptive history that preserves the truth. It is only redemptive history that preserves the reality of God saving men from their sins. Thank you for listening to me today.